So now we've kind of piqued your interest, maybe got you a little fire in your belly to, to try some of this stuff. And now, now's the reality check part of the, uh, the planning process. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> I probably need to apologize because if you listen for this morning, now you're starting to think of all those places that you've been walking past or you'll drive home today and you'll go, oh, there's one of those spots. And there's a the degradation is so widespread that you could literally spend many, many lifetimes chasing it around the landscape, trying to address it. And so what we want to talk about here for the next few minutes is some strategy. Okay. Like where are you going to start? You could go do this and have benefits in a lot of places, but if just pause for a minute in your work area and think about like, where would I start to maximize my return on investment? So next slide. It's kind of funny because every community that we start having these conversations with, Sean and I get, we ask, well, you know, let's go look at some of your gullies and talk about, you know, do you have areas that are being eroded? And inevitably we get drug out to something like this and we stand on the edge hoping, you know, no one falls in and uh, they go, well, what would you do here? And I laugh. I'm like, I don't know. I don't, wouldn't do anything. I'd just give it a name because this is a new feature on the landscape. Like this is a Grand Canyon too, right? This is not going anywhere in our lifetime. We're not going back to that historic floodplain where all the sagebrush is now. This is down in this new trench. There's lots that could be done down there, but with these kind of proactive uh, concepts, we want to actually try to find places before it gets this far. Next. This diagram is something that our, our NRCS Working Lands for Wildlife team put together. 10 years of thinking about targeting of conservation and uh, restoration in, in sagebrush and grassland ecosystems. And what we are starting to realize is a lot of these threats or impairments that we address, they're very spatially ordered on the landscape. They're not just like randomly allocated everywhere. There's certain areas that are really good and other areas that are generally really bad. And where you work, your landscape context really matters in terms of how effective you can be in the long run and achieving a lot of the outcomes that we want. Unfortunately, the history of restoration is that we go to those giant red places where for miles, the stream is super degraded and you know, or the landscape's really messed up. And we'd characterize that as kind of ambulance chasing, you know, we're reactive, we're going where it's really bad. Our success there's relatively low. And, you know, this is the million dollar a mile restoration project on streams. On the flip side, we still have a lot of country where it's pretty good. And maybe there's small incremental things that we can pick up on and address now to prevent that situation from ever getting worse. So we call those kind of our cores, our intact places. And that's where we can apply that preventative care, get after it early, relatively inexpensively, higher likelihood of success. And we build out from there. So this is scalable. You could think about this at, you know, your, your ranch planning unit scale, a watershed scale, or even bigger. But try to find the places that are good first and work out from there. Build your little cores, so to speak. Next. Be proactive. Find those opportunities for early intervention. Um, there are plenty of places to work. Believe me, you, you, you need to go to where you can optimize your time and your resources. Um, situation on the right, there's there's plenty of good we could do there, and there might be reasons to work in that place. But don't walk past the easy stuff. And um, that's the stuff on the left, that these little indicators that we could lose something. And it's much harder to put Humpty Dumpty back together again once it unravels. Next. So where do we see the greatest outcomes? It's usually when we combine all of these concepts into this kind of Venn diagram, right? Where we pick a favorable landscape context. We go to those cores or those reaches and, and segments of, of streams where it's actually relatively intact. So we put ourselves in a good place. Then we bring in 
other things like ecosystem values or services that we care about. So it might be a spotted frog or a Bonneville cutthroat trout, you know, priority areas. And you can layer that in to trim down the possible work area. And then the third, but probably the most critical aspect um, of all of this is a cultural will, right? It's the community's willingness to do something about it. So this is like, are your landowners interested, willing, ready, and able? Are your partners there with you? Um, you know, when Sean and I look for places to go provide support, we actually ask this question right up front, like, you know, is there a strong community partnership that could pull this off? Because if not, we have plenty of other places that we can go invest in. You all are ready to go. You're hungry. You've got the restoration mindset. Now we're just trying to narrow you down to like, okay, where could you have that biggest impact? So next. So Sean's going to actually dive into this more with an example from the Gunnison Basin of Colorado. But um, again, just identifying those priority areas helps you really um, hone in on specific places where, you know, while this is simple, while this is easy, it's effort and it's time. And you want to make sure you allocate that to places that you'll look back and go, man, we made some good decisions early on about that. And we've got some outcomes we like. And uh, that generally includes bringing all this stuff together, like the landscape condition, uh, often wildlife priorities, and, and that local knowledge and, and will certainly is critical to honing in uh, specific sub-basins or, or reaches to work in. So with that, Sean, I'll turn it over to you, and we'll kick off some of this local example with the Gunnison Basin. You bet. Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. <clears throat> so this... Our, our kind of pilot project in this endeavor started back in 2009. Um, so we've been doing this for a while in the Gunnison Basin. Um, and here's a couple pictures of, of when we started uh, talking to some ranchers and then Bill out doing some site assessment. Um, and this is what we called it. Uh, it was a, it was a, a climate change adaptation project. Um, they, we were interested in, in really that resiliency building you know, what can we do to make our landscapes more resilient to change uh, moving forward? Next. And we talked about, you know, Jeremy talked about this cultural will. You can see this group of folks in the bottom here, and you can see all the organizations that were wrapped into this, uh, this pilot project that we started. Um, this is the Gunnison Bacon, Gunnison Basin Working Group. Um, and this area was identified as really important. We have a sort of a unique sage grouse here called the Gunnison sage grouse. Lives mostly in Colorado, a little bit into Utah, southern Utah. You guys know about that. Um, and so that was the, the main driver for us all coming together um, for this project. Next. And this idea about working with partners, really important, uh, establishing like a shared vision for what we're up to, you know, really trying to articulate your goals and objectives, you know, more, more than just saying, hey, we just want to stop eroding meadows, um, but really trying to, to focus on those outcomes that you want to see happen as a group. So this shared vision is important um, as you're establishing these ideas. Next. And the goal that we really articulated in the Gunnison Basin was this build resilience in riparian and wetland habitats, both to help wildlife and ranchers adapt. So um, we understood that this sage grouse brings their broods, you know, during late brood rearing. You can see this nice diagram on the left, late brood rearing, you know, once the, once the uplands dry out and there's nothing to eat up there, all these succulent grasses and forbs and insects in these wet meadows become really important to um, young chicks of Gunnison sage grouse and sage grouse in general, um, and really can add to the recruitment in a critical time when, when they really need to have those, those resources to get them through. Um, and so that was our goal that we all articulated. Um, additionally, in the Gunnison Basin, you know, there's a strong ranching community. 
Um, the stock growers were on on the committee on the working group. Um, lots of of permittees and and lessees out on the landscape using public lands, and so you know we recognized in the Gunnison Basin that that we really wanted to to work on the whole community, um, and so that's why we we're including everybody in this particular effort. Next. So this idea about where she, we should work, you know, um, Jeremy mentioned there's there's just so many eroded gullies and erosion taking place across the Western landscape that it's it's hard to to try and figure out where and what to start with. Um, and so you do need to sort of prioritize and and figure out where should we work next. So we started out, we had the Nature Conservancy helping us uh, on this project from the beginning. Um, they have some powerful folks, Teresa Chapman there, who's who's doing some, some great remote sensing um, and GIS analysis. But she she's the one that made these this series of maps. You know, we we taught she used a bunch of stuff to get it restoration potential. Um, we added in Sage Graph Lex as a buffer. Um, came up with some priority reaches. Um, and then she came up with a map with some potential restoration sites. So these are some areas that, you know, you can use a desktop and a bunch of, we have a lot of different tools these days. Um, so depending on your question, a lot of different mapping and electronic tools to to really hone in on some some stuff that can maybe point us you know, at a, at a basin wide scale can point us in the right direction. Um, I'm a big fan of going to the field like Clint started with in the beginning. Um, I do think that we like to model and sit in front of our computers a little too much these days. And so the next step then is really to, to go to the field then after you've identified whatever your desktop um, type situation revealed. Next. So this idea about going to the field and, and doing an assessment, like a site evaluation. And really, we, we'd love to have, you know, the hydrologist with us, the botanist with us, um, maybe the permittee with us, um, people that have different knowledge and, and uh, ability to contribute to a particular um, inve field investigation of sites. Um, so I think that's really valuable. We like to have that. Um, I think you have a better outcome if it's more than one person doing this type of stuff, um, where you're really reading the landscape then at that point and trying to see what are the opportunities, what's what's going on. Next. So the site evaluation, you know, what are the impairments? All that you go through the whole using Bill's trilogy, really. Um of assessing a particular area. You know, what's where's the water coming from? What's the hydrology doing? What's the geomorphology doing? What do the soils look like? What's the land form? You know, and coming up with this idea about restoration potential. Jeremy mentioned it earlier, you know, some of these sites, they're so far gone, it would just take so much work and effort to try and do something there that maybe those aren't the places that we should be working because their potential is low for restoration and the chances that we're not successful um, increase. Next. So again, yeah, more, more stuff to consider. We talked about sediment supply, water, and then the feasibility and costs, you know, can you, can you get places? Next. So also, how important is the reach to your project goals? You know, our goal was about Gunnison sage grouse, a lot of it. Um, some of it was about forage for uh, for ranching. Um, but so you assess the area, hey, so are there grouse here? How are they using it? You know, that type of thing. Also, land management and ownership. You know, do you have a willing landowner or a land management agency? Typically, our best projects are ones where we work across this fence line. You know, creeks and streams and water, they don't care about fence lines. 
And so when we're trying to repair or restore riparian areas, if we can reach across the boundary, you know, and work on the next landowner over, those are the more successful projects. We can really string something good together. Maybe we're starting on the forest, working down onto the BLM, down onto the private land. Those become powerful. And so understanding what your land ownership uh, and who the neighbors are uh, is an important assessment when you're evaluating where should we work. Next. So when we started, you know, we were pretty good about pounding stakes and saying, yeah, we need to do something here. And then we figured out later on, like, whoa, how, how are we going to get here? So, you know, ease of access. Can you get materials where you need to go? Um, that's a thing, too. You know, what when you're evaluating a site, where to work, can you even get there? Or is there material on site that you could use? Next. You know, really, this is the essential question. Um, where should we work? And Bill tells us, do the easy stuff first, right? We're going to harp on this a little bit. Um, the low-hanging fruit, we like to say that a lot. The stuff that isn't going to take a lot of intervention to preserve or, or, you know, keep what we have. Those are really the things that, that we should be thinking about. And that's probably the, the first answer that we should come up with when we talk about where should we work. Do the easy stuff first. And so while a lot of stuff goes into site evaluation and, and, and goals of the, your particular group or your project area, um, this is maybe the essential one that we should be remembering. Do the easy stuff first. And Eric, I think I'm I think I'm to the end here. I'm not sure what's next. Okay. Or are we going straight into project implementation? Yeah, we're just going to roll right over into you, just into project implementation. Okay. Again, okay. if you have questions, make sure you put them in the Q&A, and we'll pick them up here in a few minutes. Go ahead, Sean. Just yeah, so project on. implementation. So now we've decided, hey, this is a good place to work. Um, let's talk about what we do next. And some of your questions are going to be answered in, in here. So let's go to the next slide. So designing treatments then. You've identified, okay, this is a good spot. Um, now we need to design the treatments. And it really does start with that reading the landscape again. Bill, Bill likes to walk a reach many times, like three or four or five times. Um, he's a super amazing critical sort of creative thinker. And so his feeling is that if you you walk a reach and you come up with solutions um, in a single event, um, that maybe those aren't the best solutions. And so he advocates even going away, you know, and and because if you go back the next day and look at it again, you just come up with the same ideas that you had the day before. Um, so I love this idea. Um, sometimes in the the real world, uh, we're not really allowed to, you know, come back three or four times and just walk it and think about it. But it is something to aspire to this idea about trying to take it all in and understand what's going on in a system before you really start designing. Um, so that's the first thing, trying to read the landscape and understand what's going on. Um, and then identifying issues and developing your objectives. And really remembering these three approaches is important. So Bill's three approaches to, to meadow wet and music meadow restoration preservation are those three, head cut control, grade control, restore sheet blow. So designing treatments that, that accomplish those three things, that's what we want to start with. Um, not like what's the structure called, but what are the approaches that we should take here when we're designing a project? Next. Similar to BDA work, which you guys are familiar with, a lot of you are there in Utah, is that these, our most effective treatments are a complex of redundancy. So that it's a bunch of structures working together in a particular reach. That's when we get the best outcomes is when it's not just maybe one or two structures, 
but we're treating the entire reach. Um, and so using a bunch of different structures to treat an entire reach, it just compounds the effects through the whole, through the whole uh, system. You can see this, this map from Teresa Chapman on the right here from the Nature Conservancy. It's got some land ownership stuff. So the dark green is forest service. Then we drop it down onto a private ranch and then we continue on down onto some BLM. So everybody's involved. Everybody knows what's going on. We're all working together to restore a particular reach and really using this complex is an important idea. Next. So layout and design, you know, uh, mapping the structures, all working together. A couple of these maps are staging maps. For example, you know, the numbers on, on the structures are numbered. And then we have like how much rock is needed at each spot. And so that's for staging. And we'll, we'll look at that in a minute. But this layout and design mapping, what you want to do, putting it on paper um, is an important, important step too. Next. So this layout and staking, this is when you're actually designing designing and staking locations. And we have a particular way that we do this. You'll see the stake on the right, this picture. Um, and we did this, we did this Monday with the crew there in Emma Park. Um, pretty exciting. We we're gonna be doing a workshop there in, in the middle of July. And we all learned how to stake stake and layout structures. So the first number at the top, and this is just my convention, but that's the structure number. So number 45. Um, and then there's the structure type, an ORD. That means one rock dam. And then the dimensions of the structure we list on the stake, four by eight by one. And the first number, we try to do this as a standard so everybody knows what we're doing but it's really the length of the structure. So that's up and down the channel. Um, so that's the first number. So it's four feet up and down the channel. We always use feet, I guess, cause we're Americans. And, you know, we're pretty much like one foot, half a foot, three quarters of a foot or a quarter of a foot. Those are sort of our estimates of, of materials, the size of the structure, I mean. So the first number is the length up and down the channel. The next number is the width. So side to side across the channel. So eight feet. And the last number is the height of the structure, one foot tall. So this is a one rock dam that's gonna be four feet up and down the channel, eight feet across the channel and one foot tall. And so if we maintain this standard, um, everybody knows what the structure wants to look like. Um, what its design dimensions are. So we do that. We record with a GPS where all the structures are. Um, I generally make this little Excel table from a shape file. You can see this blue gravel too. It's got the structure number, the structure type, the dimensions. And then I add the cubic yards, um, which is a calculation that you can get how much rock do you need to build the structure? Um, and you multiply all these three numbers together, four times eight times one, that gives you the square foot of the structure. And then kind of fancy, you, you divide by 27 and that gives you cubic yards, which is generally what we go to order with. That's what we tell like, somebody who's bringing us rock, how many cubic yards we need for a particular structure partic or for a particular uh, project. You can see at the bottom, this is totaled. We need around 38 and a half yards for this particular project. Um, that's how we figure out how much rock we need, how much materials we need. Uh, it's helpful to know which structures, you know, how much each structure has. Um, so when you're staging, but that's just our standard. Um, you can do this a number of different ways, um, but this is the way that we use. Next. So permitting and consultation, um, it really varies um, from state to state. You know, what, what place are you in? We've worked in a number of different states, Jeremy and I, and we, we always encounter different 
uh, regulatory environments um, for this type of work. And when we started this work in Gunnison, nobody in Colorado had really done any of this and didn't understand what we were doing. And so we really tried to bring those regulators out, especially from the Corps of Engineers, um, to we brought them to the field and told them and showed them what, what we wanted to do and what we were up to, why we were doing it. Um, early on, we did do, you know, delineations if we were working in wetland areas. Um, and so I guess my main, my main point here, I guess, is that it's important for you guys to understand what is the regulatory environment where you are in Utah and really engage with those regulators early and often. I think that's the best advice um, that I could give. Now, I think we've cracked this nut in a number of different states, and these techniques are becoming more and more, uh, uh, people are accustomed to them. They know about them. They've dealt with them. Um, we are restoring and preserving stuff. Um, so particularly here, the Corps of Engineers in, in Colorado, uh, with the regulators that we deal with, um, are actually excited about this work. Um, they see this as a great thing. Um, we've been able to streamline some of that uh, permitting process because they know what we're up to now. Um, you know, so just be aware of where you're working. You know, if you've got a, an ESA, an Endangered Species Act issue, you know, consulting if you're working in critical habitat. So we were working when the bird got listed, the Gunnison sage grouse got listed as threatened. All of a sudden we were working in critical habitat. So we had to consult with the service on that. And so um, just be aware of, talk to your neighbors, your other counterparts. Um, this is a great group you have in Utah. Um, and you've also you know, worked with some of the BDA stuff. And so I think there's some good groundwork already laid for this particular question. You know, NEPA with the federal agencies, um, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, but people have done done this stuff. And so I love the copy and paste method. If it's been already done um, and you guys can use it, why not? Okay, next. So materials, this is maybe one of the more challenging aspects of these projects is where can we get rock and what does it want to look like? Um, this is a, a specific mix that we, that we came up with in the Gunnison Basin for our projects. Um, that's not to say that this works everywhere. I think in, in, if you're working in smaller, sort of more petite areas, maybe you don't need sort of some of this bigger rock. So the 10% of 12 to 18, I think in general, though, most of the projects that we do, this six to 18 inch rock is, is pretty good. Um, if you've got some really big head cuts, um, maybe you're going to need some of that bigger rock. Um, and then this idea about, uh, angular rock, you know, it's pretty fancy there. We get it out of a pit in Gunnison. Uh, they blast it. It's granite, pre-Cambrian granite, they like to call it, but it's heavy and dense, angular, fits together really well. Um, so we're kind of lucky in that regard. Doesn't come with a lot of weed seed, actually none because it's blasted off of a rock face. Um, but this is one of the first things to think about when you're doing a project is what kind of rocks do we have around here? What can we get? Um, these structures can be built with any kind of rock. And Bill will tell you, he's worked in old Mexico, thousands of structures in old Mexico. And they're not fancy with screeners and, you know, all kinds of stuff like we have here. And all these structures are working. So don't be intimidated by this, it's definitely something to, to try and figure out where can you get rock. Um, but a little experience um, goes a long way, seeing what you've got, how does it work? And then this idea of having a little bit of, of the small stuff, some rock fragments. So we're trying to fit stuff together, you know, fill gaps. Um, so a nice mix of different sizes is important. Next. So find the materials again. So native rock, I get asked a lot about this. Um, native rock can be, this is one of the, the things that really attracted me to Bill's techniques, you know, when I first started this type of work is like this idea about using what you have. 
like right next door, like right there. What can we use what we have? That's the best. Um, typically, we don't, sometimes we don't have a lot of rock and sagebrush systems, right? Um, or it's, it's, it can be really time consuming to, to gather it all up. You can see right here in the top uh, photo here, this is in, oh, it's on the border between California and Nevada, right? And, and we're all going to a workshop and we're going to build some stuff. And there's all this rock along the side of the road that they've, they've pushed off the side of the road. And we had all these pickups and all these people and, and everybody just loaded up the pickup um with rock along the side of the road and we hauled it to the site it was fantastic now i do want to say this was a blm project and we paid attention very much to cultural resource concerns so we had we had the archaeologists with us and we had we talked about what we were doing what kind of rocks we were picking up and what we were using and so it's important to to understand that as well if you're using native rock Imported rock has its own advantages. Um, you can kind of specify the size and type. Um, you can get as much as you want um, when, you know, the native rock, sometimes it's it's limiting. But you need to ensure it's weed-free, it's the right size, um, those types of things. And so, you know, cracking this material nut is is one that that you need to work on early on. Next. And then how do you get it there? right? How do you get it there? Um, the top right photo, you can see a couple front end loaders, articulating front end loaders. That's probably our most expensive way of that we've ever used to get rock up the mountain, some place where we couldn't get a dump truck. Um, we hauled this stuff up to some really uh, priority areas using loaders. Um, in the lower left, this is maybe our most awesome event was when we used the U.S. Forest Service pack string, all loaded down with rock. And we were able to treat this one meadow that was really remote that we'd been really hoping to get to, but could never get any materials to. And the pack stream string was amazing at getting materials up in there. Also, you know, we designed these these staging plans. So substaging rock, you can see this map. Um, so access point number one for contractors who are delivering rock, you know, utilizing this old road, this is where you need to go, stake it out. So number two, you need two yards here, you need four yards here, that type of thing. So that can be helpful for contractors who are, you know, you've hired them to deliver your rock to where you want to need it. Um, making sure that we're being responsible with that effort as well. Next. So again, where, how, how do you get it where you need it? And, you know, we've used, I, I just can't even tell you how much rock we've hauled in the back of UTVs. Um, it's amazing. And when you see a big pile of rock and you're like, I don't know how we're going to get it all down in there, but you get two or three UTVs and we use youth groups to, to load them up for us, um, somebody at the other end to dump, um, tractors, loaders, pickups, ATV trailers, rock litters, rock bags. Um, we've used a lot of different things. Next. And then really, you know, the next step, training. A little bit of training. So with minimal training, anybody can do this work. That's one of the great things. Um, there are some proper techniques um, that we go over. Um, and project safety. Next. So this idea about place-based workshops, we've talked about this a little bit. Lower left, this is Washington State. Um, lower right, that's up there in Susanville and, and Nevada. And some of you might recognize the red shirts there in Wyoming. Um, a lot of different places where, where we're working. Yep, next. And, you know, these projects really are, they're hands-on, people love it, they get involved. Um, this is the fun part. This is the implementation. All the rocks there, you're ready to go to work, and we're building stuff. Um, yeah, this is the good part. 
and really this idea about, you know, working together. So in, that's what we're here today, get you jazzed up in Utah, empowering you to be part of this situation, um, working on these areas in Utah. Um, and it does take a group uh, for this project implementation. All right, Eric. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. All right, so <clears throat> kind of the next phase of this module four is we really wanted to kind of have some of the folks that have been working locally uh, walk you through, sorry for the those of you that are not Utah-centric, um, this is kind of a Utah-centric portion, but kind of walk you through some of the, we viewed it as barriers, things that may inhibit your ability to do this or or questions you have about actually getting it done on the process side of things. So we're going to hear from a bunch of different folks. Um, here next, I think TJ Cook from DWR is our first to kind of kick it off. And they're each going to talk about some specific implementation uh, factors. Take it away. Who's starting? Is it Jim or TJ? Uh, you're going to ask us some questions. TJ got all nervous there for a second, but so we have those uh, kind of questions that were. This is kind of the panel discussion here. Yep. Um. Go ahead. Just a second here. And I like how Sean said jazzed up in Utah. I think he meant to say that since we have the Utah jazz here, right, Sean? Man, you caught that. That's wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew that was on purpose. A little nugget of truth in there. <laughs> so I, I know one of the first questions is about um, water rights and permitting. Um, so I think Dan Fletcher was going to take some of that. If Dan, you want to kind of dive in and give us a couple of um, words of advice on that, and then we can take some questions as well. Go ahead. Sure. So when you talked about permitting, of course, we work with our state water rights office, and I know we have other states online, so you need to work with your office as well. <clears throat> I'd like to set up an appointment with those folks and talk through the process with them, and they're really helpful about helping you fill out the forms and complete those forms, and there's actually a lot of examples throughout the state as well. When I first started doing this work, I reached out to our state office bureau of land management, fisheries biologist, and he has some good examples from Idaho as well as Northern Utah that I utilize. But you wanna give yourself plenty of time to get that process done. And just remember a well-organized thorough request makes it a much smoother process. You wanna have your forms completed really thoroughly so they're not rejected and they go through really quickly. And don't forget about your internal surveys that need to be completed because you have to have your cultural and your wildlife done when you're applying for these alteration permits. And you wanna give those folks internally plenty of time to get those surveys done as well. And I like to invite people out to our projects that helped us get these ready to go. That helps build our com camaraderie and rapport internally. And it really helps with the office dynamics. And there's really no reason to recreate the wheel. There are lots of, of examples out there where people have good examples where you can get this work accomplished. So the goal of the webinar, as you can see, is all these folks online, they want to get this work completed and, and see us good, do good things throughout Utah. So everybody on this is willing to help. So reach out with questions. And real quickly, it's not as scary as everybody thinks. It's actually been really easy to get permits and all that kind of stuff. So I just want to throw that out there. That question came up in the questions earlier. It's not scary. It's actually in Utah, my experience is pretty easy. I, I, Stan and TJ might speak more to specifics, but it's it's been fairly easy. Thanks. And I, I know one of the questions is um, that often comes up, when do I need a permit and when do I not need a permit? especially as we're dealing with, you know, ephemeral streams. I think that's a question mm -hmm. that often arises is when, when is permitting actually required? Uh, 
in my experience, uh, perennial streams, if you're going to be working on a, on a stream that's got water all the time, you'll probably at least need to do a stream alteration permit. And that's where I would start going to the uh, Department of Water Rights and applying for a stream alteration permit with a little schematic design included there and, and show them what you want to do. And if you are in, like, like Sean said, if you're in contact with your uh, regulators frequently and often, they'll know who you are, what you're doing, and uh, even take them out there to see it so that they know what you're talking about when you approach them with for with a stream alteration permit. Um, when you're in the in more of an upland type situation or just a, a just kind of a wet meadow, you it may not even need a permit at all. But uh, even even then, just checking in with the, doing a stream alteration uh, because if it is a wetland, they have to pass it on to the core, and then the core might just bump it back to them, saying, "Yeah, let them go ahead and do that." But but it, like Clint said, it's it's really not that bad. And, and in fact, we've had our state engineers, regional engineers out with us on field tours and actually saying that we should do more of this. And so just go in and talk to them and just get familiar with your with your regional engineer where you might be and get familiar with the stream alteration permit process. So uh, the other question that, <clears throat> that often shifting gears a little bit is, you know, in some cases, uh, Sean was talking about this, for some of you that have already implemented some projects, is material. Where are you getting your material from? Have you found an easy way to source it? Um, what do you ask for? Those types of things. PJ, did you want to grab that one? I know you've done some of this, Jim, as well. Dan, TJ, where have we got our stuff from? So at least on the projects that I've worked on down in Southern Utah, there's no shortage of rocks on site. So we generally uh, find a source on site, designate that as a place that they can get it from. Uh, we do run it by our archeologists, whether that be the Division of Wildlife Archeologists or the NRCS archeologists to make sure that they are okay with us taking rocks from that source make sure it's not a cultural resource site. So we've been fortunate though, in at least the Southwest part of Utah. So Stan, just to clarify, is, is that seeking input from the archeologist required as part of the NEPA for the project? Or is that just something you guys are doing to avoid concerns that may arise after the project's completed? So it is, kind of part of it. So where we are bringing, where we are taking the material from on site, we're basically when, at least when I send my 106 forms in to the NRCS, they want to know where that material is coming from. And so we, we point out to where we're going to use it. And oftentimes they're even use, able to use some of the stuff that's in the washes or drainages. Um, so generally they're, they're all right with it. But if we are having like source from a major rock deposit, that's when, when we really do get them involved. And it's usually it's just sending them a picture and they'll come down and do a walk or let us do a walk on uh, a small area, so. Awesome, thanks. BL That's when you get on BLM and other land management agencies, I would definitely work with them and their, their archeologists. And like Dan said, there's, they have other things too that we, you need to make sure you're getting done. Well, and, and for, Dan and Dana, especially since a huge chunk of Utah is BLM and a lot of the places I think where a lot of us are considering working are BLM. What kind of considerations for NEPA, you know, the cultural surveys, wildlife surveys, what, what, what do we need to do on the front end to kind of streamline this so we're not languishing through it for two years or more? Yeah, and I think just kind of like the permitting, don't get overwhelmed by NEPA. It's just a process that we have to follow to do good work on the ground. And one thing about this type of work, there was a lot of support from a large variety of partners and interested public. You can utilize your uh, lintic and low tick aim data, your proper functioning condition data, your multiple indicator data to inform your NEPA. And you can also utilize all the good projects that have been implemented throughout the West already and use that as rationale for your project as well. And the controversy overall, I think, is typically low. People can get behind wet meadow and riparian restoration work. And I like to type 
call this type of work really a feel good project. You can get your partners and their interested public on the ground and make a really good positive difference on the landscape really quickly. And I noticed that Jeremy shared a NEPA document programmatic from, from uh, the Dakotas. And we actually have a document here in Cedar City as well. All that's available on e-planning. Again, you don't have to recreate the wheel. I think one hurdle that people may face is the, the unknown, especially getting management support. But my suggestion would be to get internal upper management support by watching webinars like this. And one thing I would consider to you is go big. And let me clarify that because I want to be modest and kind of go with what Sean was saying. When I say go big, you want to look at these projects on a larger seg level or even bigger. And Jeremy showed a really good map earlier in his presentation that had a water shed level map, had all the, all the stringers and all the opportunities there. You want to give yourself the opportunity to get a lot of work done and have a multi-year plan with one NEPA document where you don't have to keep redoing NEPA. I think everybody would be really surprised at how much work you can accomplish on a yearly basis when you have highly motivated people. So you can get a lot of structures done, a lot of work done in one area. So definitely go go big when you're thinking about NEPA. Dana, do you have anything you want to add to that? I was just going to add on a little bit to what Dan said about get, keeping the managers involved. Um, Eric, because you had mentioned, how do we get these projects through uh, faster than two years or something? And that really is true, is just communicating with the managers, that decision maker. Um, I firmly believe getting people out in the field to, to do that walkthrough to see what you're doing, it really helps with that understanding. Um, so that was just one small piece that with all the information we had today um, could get overlooked, but um, to get through that NEPA process, it is just a process. It's simple, do the watershed approach, but definitely involve that decision maker. So it, kind of building off from that, Dana, a lot of questions then often arise, you know, as you think about the other specialists in the office that might need to sign off, you know, on the NEPA or provide input. In terms of the range side of things, is there often a delay of grazing or a rest from grazing during a certain period of time as you implement these structures? Or is this something that's compatible with continuing or maintaining current grazing? Eric, I think that's a great question. I actually had that when we were out in the field. And um, the answer to me is it's just very site specific, you know, what needs to happen on that landscape. There's several examples out there, and I think Jim and others can add to it, where the livestock grazing is compatible with all the restoration efforts. Um, there may be some systems where it makes sense to have a year of using a different area. Um, but to me, it is just very site specific. But working with your staff specialists at the BLM, that's where that balance is of if you go so large versus going too small of a scale, where does that work out in the analysis? And again, just having those conversations, I think you can choose the right scale. But Jim, do you want to add about the livestock grazing and the rest? Sure. Yeah, what I found is that, is that typically with, with these rock structures, the, the z dike structures, is that they're really pretty grazing compatible. Uh, I mean, I think uh, Sean had a slide in there where the cows kind of like to see what's going on. They, they're curious. They go out there and see what's going on, but they they really don't seem to to uh, to mess them too much. Uh, so I I haven't seen any any too many instances where we need to to withhold grazing. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to jump to one of the questions because I think it's relevant to the exact conversation we're just having. They asked if there's some examples. Um, that they could look at um, specific to some of these projects. I think they're referring to crafting NEPA. And I think, Dan, you mentioned that, that you guys would have some. Is, or is some of that on WRI on the database? Would they be able to see some of that there? We have our NEPA doc document on e-planning, and I can drop that link in the chat and use it for what it's worth. We did that in about 2018. I think it's a pretty solid document. Like I say, I don't think you need to recreate the wheel. There are lots of examples out there that can be utilized, and you may find that you can make it better. And if you can, as you're crafting your NEPA document, be sure to share that with me. I'd definitely like to know. So I, I think that's one thing over the years in my position that I've seen that 
some BLM offices get, get really good at NEPA on a particular issue. And so it seems like we need to do a better job oftentimes kind of sharing that across you know, offices and regions of the state. Um, building off from that, Dan, you guys have done um, kind of an office-wide EA for Mesic Meadows. Do you want to talk about that just a little bit and what was involved in, in doing that? Because I think in some cases, people might be interested. I mean, you referred to going big. So what does that entail? Sure. We decided to cover our whole field office. And with that, we identified priority water sheds as well as, as streams within our office. And there's a combination of doing BDA work, PAL work, as well as is zoodite structures. So we coupled that with invasive species removal, such as Russian olive and tamarisk, and identified those prior, priority watersheds. And a lot of that, like Sean mentioned in the Gunnison, was we looked at greater sage grouse, and we were looking at getting our clearance work done in those areas and getting NEPA on the shelf ready to go because we knew that we were going to get sage grouse initiative funding through a variety of sources where we could get good work on the ground, and get it done quickly. Awesome. I, it seems like there's been more of that approach recently, trying to draw some uh, bigger boundaries around projects. Now, for individual projects, Dan, do you have to go in and provide some additional specifics as those are implemented, or are you able to just lean on that initial EA? We're able to lean on the initial EA, and we have design features built in where we get our cultural and our wildlife clearances done before we completed the work, and that's where we work hand in hand with our internal specialists and the work is really a lot of sweat equity. There's not a lot of disturbance involved. Um, so that really made it pretty simple in the big scheme of things. And like Stan mentioned, in Southern Utah, there's no shortage of rock either. And we don't really have the cultural concerns with rocks like a lot of places do. So we have all that on site ready to go. Okay, thanks, Dan. Again, if you guys have, especially for the BLM and other folks that would be working on Federal land, let us know if you have any questions. Dana, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, I was just going to add because, I mean, it is true that field offices can be different and sometimes more details are needed. And how our field office has worked on those larger projects is that we have phased them. So we have a lot of details for phase one. Um, phase two and three are outlined with those type of design features. But what we do is when phase two is ready, um, we bring that the phase two details in front of our ID team to verify if anything has changed or if the original NEPA document was sufficient. So I think in some cases, be prepared to um, maybe phase a project on federal lands and um, share the details at that appropriate time. Okay. Um, kind of moving along here, in terms of implementation, I think at least one of the conversations we've had quite a bit around this is where do we find help to do this in terms of the actual labor? Um, so what what types of resources uh, Eric, have you tapped? Yeah. Before we before we, we leave that last NEPA topic, uh, I just one thing that so we've been oh, talking great. mostly about about federal land uh, requirements. So when you go onto the private land requirements, if someone comes through NRCS for with a project on private land, our our NEPA is a bit more streamlined. We we can tear off to uh, programmatic EAs that we already have in place. And and uh, they can get done a little bit more, a lot a lot more quicker than than having to to do another EA or something like that. So so private land versus federal land will have two different requirements to go through that that NEPA process. Sorry, didn't interrupt. I actually failed to to touch on that. I wanted to make sure we covered the private land side as well because I often forget you uh, NRCS is required to do some of those NEPA documents as well. Um, okay, so yeah, I think we're going to leave the the NEPA side for just a minute. Again, if you have questions, hit us up. We'll try to get back to it. Let's get to the permitting side. So contracting, implementation, where do you find crews to work on this? I mean, it looks like um, Sean had talked about some of this being, you know, larger groups of conservationally minded people. But at the end of the day, in terms of, you know, what where have you guys gone to find help to do these projects in terms of the actual labor? Hey TJ, uh, where'd we where have we been doing up in Emma Park? Oh no, his mouth is moving, but I don't hear the words. I can't hear TJ. And he's not he's not on mute. So I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna bounce it until TJ figures out his his microphone. Stan, he's done a he's been highly involved in hiring hiring some crew. So well, sorry to steal your thunder, TJ. 
<laughs> so anyways, uh, we work through state of Utah purchasing. And what we do is we write a statement of work and then put it out to a competitive bid through, uh, like you said, the state of Utah purchasing. Um, so far, that's been pretty successful. We've actually, sometimes on some projects, you only have one bidder or sometimes you don't get any bidders. So far on the several that we've done, every time we've had multiple bidders, which is promising. And then we have had a lot of inquiries of people that want to do more work. So um, <clears throat> it's been good to have different companies do it. Uh, TJ and I have both wrote contracts different ways. Uh, the ones I've always done have been per structure, just because uh, mine are usually tied to NRCS contracts, which pay per structure. And then I think uh, some of the ones TJ did were, were based on time. So anyways, uh, that's the beauty of everything that we do is it needs to have flexibility for that, that art part of our job. So. And like you saw in my photos in my presentation, we've used UCC crews, we've used private contractors. I've worked with Stan and TJ and they've helped us hire people. I've also hired a contractor directly with some of my funding and there's more, that's, that's always another thing that holds us back from going big. We're like, who the crap's gonna do this? Yeah. And we're starting to kind of build a core here in Utah that we're getting these contractors that are doing BDAs and wanting to do restoration work and are jumping into the wet meadow technique. So we're, we're, we're building a workforce here, which is pretty encouraging. I know Dan, he's hired some crews and maybe he can speak how he's done that on, on public. Yeah, we've been fortunate to have agreements with some youth conservation corps like UCC and ACE. And we also get our, our permanent personnel out to assist as well. So that's been pretty helpful to get them on the ground and, and be proactive with restoration work. Like I say, it's still a good project. Everybody can get behind it and support it. Awesome. You can so, also go ahead. I say you, you can also hijack a, a WRI field tour and force them to work for lunch. <laughs> Remind me yeah. to check, double check what you've got on the WRI field tour, Jim. That's good to know. Okay. So just kind of moving things forward a little bit here, there's some questions that I think will kind of help round some of this conversation out. Um, so uh, Rose Smith asked, uh, in Utah, folks have folks mostly needed stream alteration permits or nationwide permit 27 for these structures since they may be considered fill in with, or fill in within wetlands? Stream alteration All permits for me. Stream alt. So most everybody's used the stream alt? Yeah, the, the process is the state engineer will assess it. And if they think it needs to be elevated to the core, then they'll they'll push it up. Otherwise, okay. if they think it's that they can take care of it in-house, they'll just issue you a permit. And that's the easiest way if you get a stream alt permit. So even though they're ephemeral streams, they still often view that as a stream altercation. Okay. So yeah. here's where I differ. I've done most of mine and they've told me, no, go ahead. There's no perennial water there. And <laughs> Stan, what do you think? So th yeah, this, this is where just talk to your office. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's different everywhere. It seems like, but we down here we went through. So each regional office within the division of wild, wild like uh, the division of wildlife in Utah, they have a water rights specialist, and we pushed that all the way up to water rights in Salt Lake, and they they came back and said, as long as it's seasonal uh, flows and no water rights in that in that stream and we didn't have to get um uh, uh an alteration permit and so that's what we did but i kept those emails for documentation just to make sure that it was we did have correspondence with uh with water rights uh, yeah and then when i'm a partner key. i tell i tell stan to send me the email too <laughs> i think that's the key whether there's not water rights associated with that stream or not so I, I think, sec go ahead, Clint. Oh, I was going to, if we're, I was just going to jump ahead to the second part of that question with the nationwide permit. But, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, um, so I'm under the context of private land. I'm working on private land and I'll, I usually do a write-up. Uh, I'll send it to, send it to the Army Corps and then just kind of gauge whether I need to get a per permit or not. A lot of times 
these don't quite fit the definition, you know, especially our drier sites of a, of a wetland. And so sometimes I've got away with not having to get a permit with the okay of the Army Corps. And other times I've had to go a little bit deeper where we have more perennial water under under the soil there. But that varies a little. But again, it's been very, it's been simple for me on private lands working with them. And we're meeting the intent of what that is, is we're gonna increase wetted habitat and they're usually on board to help us through that process and get it done quickly. Awesome, thanks. Bottom line is make sure, right? Reach out to the, your water rights folks and just cover your bases. Clearly it's not Stan's first rodeo if he's keeping emails. That's an important piece <clears throat> to kind of close the loop on a lot of that. Um, so there's another question from Alan Smith out in Grouse Creek. Uh, he says, for 150 years, ranchers have used runoff, you know, for irrigation and stock water. How do you convince them that wet meadows are better than having water downstream for irrigated crops? So I think the question here is, is do these structures affect the amount of water running off in the springtime? Uh, Alan, he warned me about this question, so I'm going to I'm going to hit it first. He sent me an email. <laughs> so generally on wet meadow stuff, I. I have never had a landowner with that issue. It's usually stream projects and it has to do a lot with beavers or BDAs or anytime we're just trying to get water out onto the floodplain on a stream. So in this instant, when we're working in meadows where it's usually runoff either really quick early in the spring or you get a big storm event late in the summer and you just get runoff for a couple hours, it, it this water isn't something that I've come into the situation where downstream users have this water come to them in an irrigation pond or they're they're not counting on this water it's it's not something that it's not a situation where this water ends up being used for situations like that i so i've just never had a landowner bring that up on on this type of work so i'm glad alan brought that up actually i don't know if anybody else has dealt with that but yeah we're, these are usually drier systems and it's just water for a minute so I think to Alan's question, the approach that I've tried to communicate to producers, um, you know, even going back to some of the early BDA work, is it's not hard for them to visualize the importance of that green meadow in August when everything else is brown. And so from a livestock production standpoint, from a wildlife standpoint, the more acres of green we have, especially later in the summer in the Great Basin, the payoff is enormous. Uh, it's quite interesting when you think about most of our forage in the Great Basin is actually grown in about a 60-day window generally, and then we live off that vegetation the rest of the year. And so these small wet metal complexes become really valuable in terms of the overall quality. So again, I think that's a there's ways to communicate that back to the producer that in terms of their uh, their grazing operations, these become really critical. It gets a little more complicated if the wet meadows aren't on their property and they don't have access to them. So I think we'll just have to deal with some of those on a case-by-case -case basis, um, specifically. Eric, yeah. Eric, when, I, when I took uh, Joe Wheaton's class on the BDAs, uh, I think they had a, a couple of, of case studies or instances where when, after they implemented BDAs on the upper part of the stream, the landowners downstream had water longer into the year than if, when they didn't have those beaver dam complexes. So they actually prolong the, the, the duration that you're gonna receive water downstream by letting it out slowly at a slower pace. So that's certainly one of the focuses that we had in, out in Grouse Creek specifically where a bunch of EDAs went in. They have no irrigation storage. So Jay Tanner, for example, he was just hoping they could slow it down to give him an extra two weeks of water because you're not changing the amount of water necessarily in the system it's just when and how it moves downstream so i think that's an important piece to remember thanks jim uh <clears throat> moving ahead really try to wrap up here so we can get moving on um have any of these projects been implemented on property protected under a conservation easement and is there any uh, experience working within a conservation easement or any constraints from an easement that may inhibit these types of projects It'd probably go to Clint or Jim would be my guess. I'll say no, but currently we have projects planned 
on properties that are work are interested in conservation easements and there's actually proposals out there to get some funding for conservation easements so possibly here in the very near future but no i haven't worked on one with conservation easement yet okay so I, I guess i haven't either <clears throat> uh, but we we have worked uh on a wma so a wildlife management area before but but uh it seems like the goals of those if it's a, if it's a wildlife habitat type easement the goals would be compatible with with conserving water so i wouldn't think that'd be too much unless there was some really specific uh call outs in the easement uh document saying what you can and can't do then you'd have to really go over that okay just a couple of quick questions and then we're up against our break um let's see uh, are they, are they, like, this kind of relates back to the grazing questions. Are any of these structures commonly fenced off for a period of time? I think the answer is generally no. Dan or Dana, anybody, is that, there been anything contrary to that? We haven't fenced any off, no. And you could, you could use, like Sean said, drift fences to just keep them out of the bottoms and that would have them avoid the BDAs, but we haven't really had to do much fencing unless there's an issue. So I think overall the consensus is, is most aspects of the z dike stuff is completely compatible with current grazing um, management. All right, I think that pretty well wraps us up in terms of a question, maybe one more real quick. Uh, no, I think we, we covered them all. Okay, so, uh, Moving forward, we're going to jump into a break. We'll have you all back in about 10 minutes. So about, we'll say 1025-ish, be back and ready to go. And we've got, uh, to we're going to talk about monitoring and then kind of a wrap up. So again, if you've got some questions we didn't get to, just hold them. And maybe we'll have time in that wrap up to get back to your questions. So everybody, grab a drink and stretch your legs.